Why is the book of Mark so short? That's what we're going to talk about today in Mark 1. All right, we made it to Mark 1. We're on our second gospel book. Interesting thing about Mark is, chances are, it was the very first gospel. There's always going to be these debates, and we keep finding older and older versions of the scripture, and it changes our view of it. Initially, people thought Matthew was the first book written, and that Mark was a recap or a, I'm going to pull details out, maybe a pamphlet, and hand it out to Romans. So he took all the pieces, parts out of Matthew and did that. I think they said only 7% of Mark is unique in the gospel, while 43% of Matthew is unique. Now they tend to feel that Mark was actually the first. Mark was John Mark, and he was what people call the interpreter of Peter, that he wrote in Greek, and this book was written in Greek. They call it a very low level or a common person's version of Greek. But here's the thing is that Mark originally traveled, which we'll see in the book of Acts, with Paul. There was some kind of a falling out. We'll get to that some other day. And then he started traveling around with Peter. Some people believe then Mark is actually the gospel according to Peter and that Peter is the person who translated it into Greek. The other part of it to keep in mind is that when Jesus talks about, as we talked about in Matthew, that I tell you this, you know, this generation will not end before these things happen. So they thought the end of the world was coming before they were going to die. What Jesus meant was before everybody dies. And so when they start getting older, when they start realizing, uh uh-oh, they suspect that Peter and the apostles were young guys under 20, because at a certain age, you had to pay taxes and they were not asked to pay taxes, or at least there was no indication of it. So they believe that the apostles, particularly the Fisher guys, were young men. And now suddenly we're getting to later times. They are getting older and people did not live as long back then and thinking, oh no, we have to write this down. Up to this point, they could talk to Peter. They could talk to someone who knew Peter. They could find out something from him directly. But when they realize, wow, we're going to die, this has to come down and be put onto paper. So there was some sort of urgency. The idea is why all of a sudden did these gospels that went from, it feels that we think, from being oral traditions, things that were handed down person to person, why did they suddenly start getting written down? Mark, they think, was written a few years before 70 AD. In 70 AD, the temple comes down. This is over with. That's why they feel that Mark was writing down the words of Peter maybe before he died. There's also another tradition out there that said the man who was wearing the linen cloth, and then when Jesus was arrested, someone grabbed the cloth of this young man, and the cloth came off, and the man went that away, and he ran off without his (laughs) linen cloth. That was Mark. He witnessed the arrest of Jesus. So he wasn't an apostle, but he was a disciple, which means he was a follower of Jesus, just not one of the official 12. Again, some people feel that it was written right before 70 AD when the temple was going to come down, but other people feel that it was written around 50 AD. Think about that, that if Peter was under 20, let's say that he was almost 20 at the mission of Jesus, right? So he would have been 20 when Jesus was 30 something. So that means when the Jesus is put to death, Peter still would have been a young guy, but again, people did not live that long, and the apostles didn't live that long. We'll find out, according to tradition, that most of the apostles, we think all of them, died through some sort of persecution. They also believe that when the early church met, they met in Mark's mother's house, Mary, and we'll talk about that someday. He made a short book, and people feel like Mark is so short because this was for Rome. Rome was about action. It was about dialogue, like Matthew. I'm going to create all the lessons. I'm going to tell all the stories in nine sessions. And I'm going to talk about the prophecies and the Jewish heritage and how Jesus is a fulfillment of all of those things. Nope. 
Mark was writing to Romans, and Romans wanted the short story. They wanted to get to the action, find out what was happening, and get out. They weren't going to listen to all this Jewish stuff that they didn't care about because they were Romans. They had their own sets of gods, and they also felt like at this point, the church was coming under persecution. So these may have been Romans who became Christians who never saw what happened to Jesus, got it secondhand, and he's trying to write something to either help new Christians who are Romans understand Jesus, but also to get other Romans who may not have any connection with Jesus to learn about Jesus from his book. So a lot of the elements, much of the Jewish birth story and everything else was left out. And the picture that we get from Matthew is a fulfillment of prophecy, the teachings to Jewish people so they understood. Matthew doesn't explain anything that is Jewish because he expects his audience is Jewish. But meanwhile, Mark's gospel is Roman. He's telling people Jesus is the Son of God. And we're going to find out why that's not such a crazy thing. So we're going to see a lot of things inside of Mark. We're namely going to see action. We're going to see the plan. We're going to see that Jesus is the Son of God. And he's not a new God. He is the God of the Jewish people. But we're going to give them enough information so they understand this path, but not drown them in details about things they don't care about. So Mark starts out in one with a title, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. There's our title. That's the title of our book. And then he immediately quotes Isaiah, the prophet, who says that the messenger is going to come before preparing the way in the wilderness. This is Isaiah 40. And also reference to Malachi 3.1, but he is setting the stage for how this comes about. The Romans were not mm, hard-minded atheists. Remember, they believed in many gods. They picked up many gods. They probably had a few of their family gods, and then they had the Roman gods, and then you throw in a couple Caesars in there too. So they believed in the supernatural and in the concept of God and the Son of God. So this would show them that this was all meant to happen, and they would understand that. So we first discuss in Mark then that John is appeared and is baptizing people. Again, John is the cousin of Jesus from Mary's cousin, Elizabeth. Goes in the wilderness, he baptizes people, tells them to repent, which means just turn back, go back the other way. And people from the entire countryside and other countries were coming to confess their sins and be baptized says that he was, again, wearing the camel's hair. He ate locust and wild honey, which is either probably bugs or bean locust and wild honey. And he says that someone else is coming and they're going to be more worthy than I am. And when I'm baptizing you in water, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So first of all, the thing that we understand about all of this is that when Rome came about, they understand what it means to have a Messiah. In fact, they even knew the word gospel. They understood the good news because every time a Roman empire, every time a Roman emperor was named, they would say that this was gospel. This was joyful tidings, good news, because Caesar Augustus was having a birthday or he was brought to the throne. This is a known concept. And Christianity is stealing this concept and saying, no, here's the real good news. This is the real son of God coming now. Jesus comes and is baptized. See, we're missing. We missed the whole Jesus birth story. We missed everything. Quickly, there's John. He's baptizing people. Here comes Jesus. Jesus says, yo, you have to baptize me. The heavens were torn open. The spirit descended on him like a dove, not in as a dove or in the image of a dove. And God said, you are my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Only Jesus saw it at this point, but boom, all happens. Then it just says Jesus was tempted. He was out in the wilderness. There was a bunch of animals out there. He was tempted by Satan and the angels ministered to him. That's it. That's the story because Mark keeps it short. We'll keep it short, but you can tell he's telling the actions. I want to point out one other thing that's really interesting about this is you see where the word immediately is used. Um, The spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. Everything is action Jackson. 
We're going to have things happen very quickly and we're going to point it out. Everything is quick. Mark is taking things out of order a bit because he's trying to put together this cohesive piece of action that the Roman mind would understand. And that's why you always find out when you talk to people, well, what's your favorite gospel? Some people like me, I grew up Jewish. I love Matthew. I love the whole tying everything together. People love Luke because it's such a warm and amazing story. John, John says it all. He explains the entire Christian faith. But people like Mark because it's full of action. And so we're going to see that as we go. They said that this word immediately is called Uthus, E-U-T-H-U-S, and it is used 41 times in the Gospel of Mark. Remember, action, immediately, right now. It's all going to happen quickly. Now, again, when we come up with stories that we talked about in Matthew, I'm not going to talk about them in depth all over again. I will try very hard to get references put in the show notes to bring you back to the chapters that talk about the parable in full so that you can listen if you haven't listened to before. But we're not going to recap everything as it stood. We're going to talk about differences, changes, why this point was made as compared to the whole story, or whenever there's a new parable that we haven't heard of before. But think about the Romans. They're going to love decision and action. And it goes right into it and says, Jesus begins his ministry. Right after John was arrested, boy, that came late in Matthew, Jesus comes into Galilee claims the gospel, the good tidings, the good news, and says the time is fulfilled, the kingdom is at hand. Repent, turn around, and believe in the good news. This would have meant something again to the Romans. They knew the word good news, and they saw this was happening now. So Jesus was walking around the Galilee. He sees Simon and Andrew, calls him, follow me, they called, and they came. Then he saw James and John, the son of Zebedee, he called them too. And they immediately, there's that word again, came. So we are building our team together. No dilly-dallying with any sorts of situations that are there. Someone brought up the point that there are two Greek words for time. One is chronos, and that means chronological time, like a clock. But kairos means an opportunity. The moment has arrived. And this is the word that Jesus is using. He is not saying, oh, check your clock. The calendar says this is the time. Right now, he's saying, right now, here's your chance to be with Jesus. Take it up. Then Jesus starts healing people because, of course, he is. He's a man of action. Went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath entered the synagogues and started teaching. And he had authority, not as the scribes, but immediately again there was a synagogue and immediately there was in the synagogue a man with unclean spirit and he cried out. First of all, just notice that first of all, he's doing it on Sabbath. You have a couple immediately's in here because again, Jesus is the man of action. But the thing that Mark points out here is that he had authority. A lot of times the rabbis were a bit like lawyers, biblical lawyers. Well, according to Bob in chapter three, verse four of this text, you know, that was in the Midrash, this is what's supposed to happen. They refer, everything's a referral or a footnote. Instead, Jesus is like, I'm saying it, it is happening. Or what was in the King and I? So it is written, so it is done. Action. So Jesus sees the man who has a spirit and the demon recognizes him and he says, be silent and come out of him. We're going to demand him out of there. And the unclean spirit comes out of him. And everyone was amazed saying, what is this? A new teaching with a man of authority? So again, Romans would have really liked that. And this isn't a lie. This isn't propaganda. This is basically taking the parts of the story that Romans would have appreciated the most and cutting out the details that would have bored them silly. And it says in verse 28 of chapter one, and at once, see that? time frame again. His fame spread everywhere throughout the surrounding regions of Galilee. The word got out. So Jesus heals many people and goes to Simon, Peter's house, and his mom is sick. So he came in there, took her hand, and the fever left her. Then she began to serve them. See, even Peter's mother is a woman of action. Sundown came, 
A lot of people brought people who were oppressed with illnesses and demons to Jesus and he healed them. And he says that they wouldn't permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And Jesus' time to talk about him was not here yet. Then they get up in the morning. It was still dark. Jesus is a guy who gets up early. And Simon, Peter, who was with them, searched for him and said, hey, everyone's looking for you. And then Jesus said, well, let's go to the next town so I can preach there too. So they went throughout all of Galilee, the region, and preached in the synagogues, casting out demons. It's funny. Peter had different plans than Jesus instead of what Jesus was doing, which was praying. So then a leper came to Jesus and said, hey, heal me too. And at that time, there was no cure for leprosy. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. And he says, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And Jesus told him to go do the cleansing process that Moses commanded. And the question that came in my mind, I wonder how many times that cleansing process ever happened because this was a bacteria, among other skin disorders, but there was no cure for these. And so that's why they were tossed out of the cities because it was so contagious and no cures and eventually would kill you. So this was probably the first dude that shows up and said, hey, I want to do that thing. Jesus told me to come here and do the thing. And they were probably quite shocked about that. So my meditation for this week is thinking about how different people like to hear those different messages. The fact is that the Romans have different appreciation for Jesus than the Jewish people would. I mean, even today, we have Christians who grew up who have one kind of appreciation, while people who are me, like who are Jewish, have maybe a different kind of appreciation. I'm going to think a little bit on my meditation time about how we all appreciate different aspects of Jesus. My prayer for this week is that everyone, regardless of their background and their perspective, believes in Jesus and hears the message that means the most to them. I would not have guessed the message I got would have meant so much to me, but it was the Holy Spirit's work that worked in me. You never know what kind of message you're going to get and what kind of reaction you're going to have until it happens. So I pray that people will hear that right message. And what I'm going to share this week is share with people that Jesus is the Lord of all people, regardless of your perspective. And if there are certain aspects of the Bible that appeal to you more than others, that's totally fine. God comes to us and I think gives us all these different parables about very similar topics because we all have different understandings. Some of us fish, some of us throw seeds around, and some of us are baptizers like John. We all have that different perspective. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember, you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. The website, The Bible in Small Steps, is available, and I am working on it, trying to get different resources and things available to you. I think one of the things I want to come out with soon is a list of the commentaries I use. Obviously, commentaries shape your view of the message as well as your background and other things. But that's what I'm going to try to get out to you so that you have it available. Thank you so much for listening. Mm -hmm.